You don't know what you got yourself into, do you? It's the last day of a conference. It's the first recording of the last day. Uh, the caffeine hasn't hit yet. He's in a bad mood. I'm in a, bad I'm in mood. a good mood. And so the combination of this, like we've gotten to the point at certain times in the day, we warn guests, right? We don't warn them until they're set down and the recording button buttons pushed, right? Just saying. Uh, we had a guy last night. He was a little shell shocked. He didn't know what to say. I'm just going to be reactive. Uh -huh. he, uh, he intended on speaking on leadership. Did he get anything out? I don't know. <laughs> I know you keep kicking the camera. It's a terrible placement. Just, that's entirely my fault. I just don't kick your drink over. That's the biggest thing. It's uh, that would make it for a bad. While you're already in a bad mood, so it it won't spill. It'll be fine. I should have gotten you a drink. I thought about it, but also I don't like you. So yeah, that's a good point. I'm good with that. <laughs> I wasn't that worried about it. How are you, sir? I'm great. Introduce yourself. Yeah. So Kevin Robinson, GM of Shop Management for Velo second time at Ratchet and Wrench. Last one I was at was actually the uh, the last one they had in Minneapolis. Ah. Uh, Were you guys at that one? Yeah, the furries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the furries. So what's funny about this is my wife, Ashley, actually came with me on this trip. A little yeah. time away from the kids, a little pool time, right? Right. And I told her, I said, this, this was the conference, I don't know if you remember, but I went to it a few years ago and it was in Minneapolis. And literally the first thing out of her mouth was, was that the one with the people in the costumes? This was a throwaway line that I sent that I gave her when I got home from that conference. And it's all that she remembers main, mainly about my job. Yeah. Hey, I mean, like eh, my wife doesn't really know anything about like what we do here, or what I do at work or I mean, that's just your wife knows more about you. I think as far as your task, I tell her I work really hard. That's all she knows. <laughs> I come home tired. I'm like, oh, I'm so tired. And she's like, oh, you must have worked really hard. I'm, yeah, I sure did. <laughs> There's videos of David sitting at his computer, just laughing away, watching YouTube videos in the middle of the day. I was, I was trying to show somebody something. I don't watch YouTube videos all day long. And he turns around. He's like, get, get back to work. <laughs> Where do I see the David reacts YouTube channel? Oh, no, this is like you need to have like that. shop specific content and just a square like picture in picture of David in the bottom right corner just reacting. That would be awesome. Well, we, we have those. You were there. No, I, no, I'm saying just you. Just a just a why, channel with just, just you me? responding. What am I going to say? Terrible, terrible things like you usually do. <laughs> <laughs> it would even give me more of an excuse because I have a six year old who's obsessed with YouTube and reaction videos, right? right? Mr. Beast reacts and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, so yeah. now I could like, we could work David into the algorithm now. Have you seen the stuff with Mr. Beast? Uh, oh, I have a six year old. Absolutely. Every time we go to Walmart, it's can I have no, 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 feastables? No. Have you seen the controversy? Oh, that's a thing. No, I've not even <laughs> seen it. What is it? <laughs> What's that? Well, he, he had somebody in there that, um, Wanted to live uh, an alternative lifestyle. Let's say it that way, and and there were everybody was very supportive on the show and everything was fine, um, but turns out they were in the background um, sharing inappropriate content featuring children, and it was getting passed around within the Mr. Beast inner circle. He like went into hiding well, he first came out and he's like, I'm going to sue everybody that says anything because this is all false. But then like the discord chat rooms logs all came out and the actual conversations started coming out and then employees started coming out saying, yeah, we kind of knew this was going down. That's why I quit because we kept telling them like, hey, these two guys over here that are in your inner circle or whatever, they're doing stuff they shouldn't be doing. Yeah, that's you go. Rough. it's officially complicated legacy, Mr. Beast. Like, yeah, that's, that's well, I mean, you, the, you get yeah. to that level, it's going to happen, right? Like sooner or later, you're going to get to that level and somebody in your organization is going to accidentally take you down. This this was like one, one of his on core, like this was one of the very first people he had in his group when he first started, like zero subs. He was one of his friends, right? One of the and, ones that they like did the whole YouTube learning process yeah, with yeah. so like yeah. the very first people he started with but, but 
people then started going back and watching videos and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours of content. But then they started seeing like pictures hanging on walls, mm -hmm. hand drawn, but inappropriate not to be in a children's video, but just in the background. But, you know, these are grown men that are doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing um, with minors. And then they put like artwork on the artwork. I say that very loosely on the walls with stuff going on and people started noticing. And so all, the, all of a sudden those videos start coming down. All of this. You didn't see any of this? No, I did. I did. Yeah. Oh, did you? Yeah. yeah. I'm on Reddit. You know, mm -hmm. there's, like a whole, uh, like, there's tons of threads right now about like the yeah. fall of the empire. Basically, yeah. but, I mean, he's still super popular, but yeah, there's a lot of like inner circle it's mistrust not, and it's things happening. It's not just um, it's not just Mr. Beast. There was another very popular s streamer. Uh, his name was Doctor Disrespect. Have you seen that Gamer. one? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, that and the whole mess came out, and so you know, I uh, I'm super freaked out about what my kids watch on YouTube. Yeah, uh, we're not I doing like, YouTube. My my daughter posts on YouTube, but that's the extent of it. Yeah. Uh, Sounds like there's a lane to be carved for like good wholesome shop content. Then maybe something featuring David. Wholesome, <laughs> yeah, like very wholesome David. D David for like, kids. I David, no. wholesome. No, David's no. David's a lot of things. Are wholesome. you interested in getting in the trades? I'm just I have glad, something for you. <laughs> I'm just glad that the most controversy we have in this oh. industry is like arguments between coaches, right, <laughs> and and them fighting things out. Um, and then yeah. we obviously have a couple shop softwares melting down all at the same time and like getting their TikTok on. Um, and that's yeah, what really are you talking about this bunch of CD stuff going around in the industry all the time. What do you, what are you talking like about? Like what? Like what? Just sketchy stuff. Just, you know, inappropriate stuff, sketchy stuff, like sad stuff. And you just see like, because you, there are families involved, children involved, marriages. There's always something. Yeah, but something. I mean, those are like, those are base level, everyday human beings having those types of, of reactions. That's what I'm saying. There's just always some drama going but on. I'm just saying for the most it's part. Not drama like, free. Like, no, I'm saying like the, the organizations for the most part, the bigger organizations within our circles are not too dramatic. No, I guess not. They're for super conservative though. Like, they don't put themselves out there. For example, you guys were arguing about getting on TikTok. Like, hey, we're fighting over TikTok <laughs> or not. Terrible idea, by the way. But it's just because you support the Chinese. I don't support that Chinese app. <laughs> it's about demographics. No. It's about demographics. No Who is on controversy TikTok? Here. We are Who is all... On <laughs> it's, uh, we I'm, are I'm just saying, like, you got to look into demographics. Who is your <clears throat> typical shop owner, software buyer? Not the owner necessarily, but who's making the purchasing decisions in the shop, mm -hmm. and then who's on TikTok, and do they mesh? Oh, I, I would think we're getting no. there. I think that I think like Instagram makes more sense. I think Instagram makes. More There's sense. some interesting th things happening there. The thing the the I don't even know if you can call it drama, but the thing that I like the most about, especially coming to these shows, is there are a lot of professionals in the industry that are with whether it's software provider shop, coach, consultant, wherever you want to say it. Um, and every show I go to, somebody's at a different booth wearing a different polo at that time. Yeah. So there's just like, there's a lot of shared DNA and you know, there's not, there's not a ton of like people going to competition, but there are definitely, you know, somebody's like literally six months after six months after six months, like, Oh, he's over here. And now he's yeah, over for here. Sure. And now he's over crazy. there. And, it is um, pretty crazy. I hadn't thought of that. So it's just, it's interesting, right? Because you see a lot of people and some just start new companies, some start new products, but it's just interesting because of the, some are competitors yeah. and you know, the six months, this is the best product that you will ever use. And then at the next show, they're like, listen, so speaking, people we that do that, about though, this product. Yeah. The people that do that though, like they lose all their credibility because you come to me and you're pitching me on a product and you're saying that's the best thing ever and you've got a good pitch or whatever. Okay, great. And then you show up six months later and you're with a different company. And now you're telling me that thing is the best thing ever. Right. I call them out. Mm -hmm. Typically, I will call them out and be like, what happened? Yep. Well, I had a better opportunity. Like, okay. <laughs> so you're full Can't of crap happen. is what they're telling me. You're full of crap. And so you're, you're a 
there's nothing. I, hey, I don't, I don't knock them. It's just that I just don't buy their stick, their spiel. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Because it's like you're telling me this. I don't believe it. It's because they're paying you the most. So when the next company comes in that pays you the most, you're going to jump on all over that. I don't. I don't know. Everybody's got to go after. Everybody's got to work the opportunities that are presented to them. Right. Some might be part of a layoff some might be part of you know whatever and it's all they know but yeah david you're like the credibility piece they got to spend a lot of time working back any goodwill that they yeah, have for with sure the customers and we, we I, saw I a couple prefer, really do that like i see really them do it now to this day you see them jumping around or they'll they move across the country and then like they're like hey i'll take that job you're gonna pay me this much no oh, okay i guess i'll stay with this company hey this company's still the greatest thing ever like get out of here dude like you're full of crap i don't i have no problem with you know tr- trying to maximize your opportunities it's whatever but at the same time like don't if you're if your job is to sell me on this product like and all you're doing is hyping it up but then I know that you're just going to go wherever like you don't believe in the product. That's why like I appreciate uh, what's this nuts from uh, auto ops. Yeah, because the, the dude like he started the company, his whole family works in the company and he almost looks awkward trying to pitch you his product. You talking <laughs> about Steven? Yeah. yeah. Steven's awesome. He, he, loves he Steven. looks awkward trying to pitch his product because he's like, <laughs> he's he's like I'm like, gonna I'm gonna stick you and I'm like, okay, go for it. And and then he tries and you're like, well, it was a good attempt. I appreciate that. But I know he believes in his product. Yeah. Yeah. Well that's why we're so loyal to Monique, right? Is because of uh, she's been consistent, right? I'm sorry, we're loyal to Monique more than we are to Shopware. <laughs> Oh, that hey, you know what? No, 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 what are you talking about? There's lots of there's lots of great people she, at, at she, there is. I'm not saying there's not. I'm no, just no, saying. She's, Would she's you got, quit kicking the damn camera? It. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jeez. I just keep watching him out of the background, like twitch and shaking. I'm like, dude, he's I'll, got. I'll put I'll put the steady cam the, on it. The first time the that AI I worked, uh, the the Monique side of things is funny because the first time I ever worked a show with her as yep. part of Shopware, um, she this was at gosh, where was this at? It was earlier this year. I can't remember. There's been too many shows. But um, to your point about like loyalty to Monique at Shopware, right. absolutely true. Somebody came up, longtime customer. Oh my gosh, it's been so long. I love using Shopware. You're my favorite person at Shopware. Thank you so much, Angelique. And she was like, <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Just like a true Monique fashion. Like, I'm not going to correct this person. Like, I'm too nice. Um, and she's like, Actually, Angelique might be kind of a cool rebrand. Like, you, know, I, you know what I mean? Hey, like, that's that like, at least cool. it wasn't like Monica or, you know, something. I think I've heard generic, somebody call her Monica before, which could, I mean, yeah. As long as you hit the M, like maybe that's maybe she's it's like me. Yeah. My name's Kevin C A V A N. And I'm like, as long as you get the the K or the C sound out, you like, get a lot of I'm gonna, tons of Kevin. Really? Cal, uh, it's actually funny because when I jump on zooms, like, and my, my video isn't up yet. And it just is my name. People are kind of left to guess, right? So I get a lot of cabans because I think they probably think I'm like Eastern oh, European. I, I would or, totally do that. Yeah. I'd be like, "Hey, Kevin, Based. it's Kavan. <laughs> Thank you." Oh, you would correct him. I would totally correct him. I would totally correct yeah. him. Um, <laughs> that would be awesome. I think I, you know, for my relatives, I still get like Christmas cards, and it'll say Kelvin or Kevin or. Oh man, like, that that gives me like. Uh, heebie-jeebie flashbacks my barber his name's kevin and i called him kelvin for years <laughs> because it was <laughs> like you're so like he had convinced. misspelled it and on his never, facebook and, and i oh, never geez. did catch on that he he like he's like i right, man my name's actually kevin i i misspelled it on facebook i couldn't even figure out how to change it <laughs> you call everybody <laughs> guy hey my guy you know what know though that, eh, that kind of sounds like it's on him though <laughs> yeah right? i mean like, maybe a there little is bit evidence still. there like it wasn't just a shot in the dark where you like you misheard him at one point and for the rest of his life he was yeah, getting figured out how to change it now so <laughs> it's all good <laughs> i'm messing stuff up here no nah, it's you okay you want cameras anything? never mind power strip yeah it's fine you know, everything's shut off now great <laughs> <laughs> even worse <laughs> root problem we know who it is so um you recently kind of like stepped up into this new role um at Velo to do all kinds of new cool stuff. What yeah. what is what was that change? Because we've known you for a long while now, yeah. and uh, it's really cool to see you get the opportunity to advance. And I know there were a lot of shifts in brands and and stuff like that. How did all this come to be? 
Yeah, good question. So, man, um, it doesn't seem like that long ago, but I started in 2020, so it's only yeah. been you know just over four years. And when I started, we only had two shop management systems mm-hmm. under kind of this Velo ecosystem, right? It was Shop Boss and it was Omnique. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And within Monique used to work for Omnique. With, yeah, she was and this Monique is, from Omnique. <laughs> You think about branding, like right. there's been some conversations, right? Like, ah, Monique, would you like maybe want to do a little bit of Omnique stuff again? And she's like, mm, I'm really good at shopware. <laughs> yeah, really like um, but two products, and now we've grown to six. So shopware was our most recent product to join the family back in March. Yeah. So now we have this like wide range of different solutions, and we're really try like the biggest thing from a responsibility standpoint is like how do we not step on each other, right? It's yeah. so different from everything else you're seeing in the industry. You throw them in a the pit, platform. Make them all fight each other, see who comes out alive. SMS fight club. And yeah. yeah, you do a whole fight club thing. And if it doesn't work out, you can just smush them all together and just call Ooh. it like shop boss, wear omnique. <laughs> That's, you nailed it. You know, we'd have we'd have total complete domain, there, yeah. domain authority. <laughs> yeah, that, like, th- just, just put tabs. Tail. Like, what do you want it to look like today? I'm Nick. There you go. I'm gonna run this today. <laughs> we. Uh, it's actually funny you say that because back in I think it was Q4 last year. Actually, you guys know Lisa Coyle. Oh yeah, of course. From 360. Now she's at Promote. Started promoted with Joel, but um, she actually she and I partnered on a on a. I think it was kind of a webinar or something where we actually did shop management Shark Tank last yeah. year. Yeah. And we brought all six products in and basically said, hey, give us your best pitch. And then we had, you know, a few people. We had Jesse from 360. We had Sam from AutoServe One. We had a couple other people. We had Jill Trotta come mm-hmm. in. Um, and they were our sharks. And the shop management, each person came in, got, I think, two minutes to pitch their product. And then we literally, at the end, like crowned a winner, essentially, right. of like the best pitch. Uh, who was it? I can't remember who won. I think it was Shop Boss. I think Frank Jones. Um, oh, wait. Actually, hold on. Let me think. No, it might have been Darren Williams from Protractor, actually, now was that it? I think about it. Yeah, because we did a couple of those. But because we did one recently for um, websites as well, digital websites, which was kind of cool. Sorry, Mandy's flagging me from from. Me. That was the winner. Okay, so I'm wrong both ways. It was Tiger Guru. It was probably Josh Nail. Was it Josh Nail? Okay, so it was Josh with Nail from Tiger Guru. That was Mandy. That. You can sit down and record too. <laughs> Mandy, uh, she likes to she likes to direct from afar. She's great. Come on, sit down. No, I was like, nah. Mandy's Mandy's like Kevin has to do awards dinner rehearsal that they're what, calling him that? for. And what did time you, did you talk to him? Okay. Yeah, we're good. It'll we'll work it out. out. I, we're just, we're just, we're, we did the, um, I don't know if I, did I see you guys drive for the Thunderdome last night for the, did you see no. that whole thing going on no. back there? So no. in the exhibitor showcase last night on the back side, we actually had a RC car mm-hmm. race, the Velo victory lap. And <clears throat> we had six races or six championships. Oh, that was the video of could, Chris and the... They came dressed as Talladega Knights characters. Yeah. yeah. We had Ricky Bobby. We had Cal Naughton Jr. And for the life of me, I'm not going to remember the um, Sasha Baron Cohen character, but um, the dude that raced for Perrier. Anyway, um, six winners. And then so tonight as part of the awards dinner, we're like, we have like specially branded Velo product RC cars, like legit RC yeah. cars that we're giving away as like awards tonight as part of that. So, you know, a shopware cool. uh, user won the All Star Award, right? The, oh, um, I feel like I've been so unplugged the last few days, um, but I did see that those awards came out recently. Which, which shop Tom, was it? Tom Shear. Tom Shear. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, Tom yeah. won the, and he's a shopware user. Yeah, he was yeah. on the show yesterday. Oh, Tom's nice. a good friend of mine. Right. So, yeah. You, you need to go like a uh, tiny. Yeah, he's I got his go speech. He's got to do, sure. and just be like, "Hey, man, how many times did you mention shopware in there?" Right. Like, <laughs> when like you, hey, for every time I have a ten dollar bill. <laughs> and, no, Tom's <laughs> kind of money. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just not going to do anything. Yeah, you can go to a like twenty. A bit. <laughs> Start going up a little bit. So, do you? How do you feel about Abraham Lincoln? <laughs> how do you feel about? <laughs> how do you feel about Susan B. Anthony? Wait a second. <laughs> Is she on it? She's on something, isn't she? Yeah. Probably isn't sure. It like a coin? Maybe yeah. it's a coin. I'm going to say it's a coin. It's, like, it's, an, <laughs> it's definitely a coin, although I don't know what currency. I think it's a dollar. Like a dollar coin? No? 
Lucas is going to find out. I am. I'm going to. We're going to. We had this conversation earlier about like what would we do now without search engines. We would literally go have to find somebody that should have used Chat GPT. That would have been better. Well, really? Chat GPT is the bomb diggity. Says uh, the Susan B. Anthony dollars United States dollar coin minted from seventy nine to eighty one when production was suspended due to poor public acceptance, and then again in 1999. <laughs> poor oh public acceptance. What? Who wants to carry Sorry. a dollar coin? Not many people want to carry coins yeah. in general. Although, I'm, I am, like, impressed that you, like, pulled that from the Jeopardy side of your brain. I remember Do you seeing upkeep the, coin, the Susan B. Anthony wiki page, too? Like, <laughs> he, Wikipedia page? Just, like, dude, he's got lots recent, of them. <laughs> recent update by David Roman. He knows a September little bit about a lot of things, and he just, yeah. like, randomly Can drops bits of the breadth and the depth. Way. That's the... Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Now that we've talked about currency. Yeah. What else? Oh, we can de- <laughs> dig deeper into currency. We can get into it if you oh, want. Don't don't you yeah. King How about 360 over payments? I Ooh. get $10 every time I mention a Vila brand. Really? No. <laughs> but, oh, but man. That would be fun. <laughs> yeah, because you talk about it a lot. You know. This is <laughs> How do we get signed up for that? Because <laughs> I'll slip those suckers in every five minutes. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> well, you already... Uh, see, you've already put yourself in a bad position because you're just thinking about combining the brands. So you're like, if I just mention this one time, yeah. I get paid one royalty. But that's why you got to keep 16 brands separate because... Have you ever thought about working a mac and cheese truck into the Velo market? That's, that's, Do tell. Hey, they're going to keep expanding out. Eventually, it's going to be Walmart, Amazon, and Velo. They own everything. That's how it's going to go. Oh, the mac, mac and cheese. <laughs> I'm telling you. Did you see Walmart just bought Vizio? No, I did not see that. They bought Vizio. So yep. now your Vizio TV it's is gonna, going yeah. to be a Walmart, Walmart. billboard. <laughs> yeah. There you go. That's rough. Put it in demo rough. mode. They, yeah, just watch Walmart, Walmart ads, ads all, all day long. Dude, I could not imagine. <laughs> there is a uh, just on the product side of things, nothing that we've done, but things that we've been pitched a lot is think about. So I gave a presentation yesterday on DVI, right? Yeah. So a lot of um, products, companies, you know, whatever you want to say, have come to us and come to other DVI providers and been like, hey, what if we did display ads on your consumer facing oh, DVI world? Right. And we're like, I feel like that's maybe a little bit like it, not intrusive, but like you especially think about it from like a UI perspective, right? Yeah. Who hates the, you know, you go to an article online and you're reading it all of a sudden pop up from the bottom, pop up from the top, pop up overlay. So, yeah. but there's almost a lot of unusable. interest in like, hey, if I pull up my my as a consumer, right, the inspection report that I have and I'm reviewing it, what if there was a little banner in there for you know X product? I won't call it any names here, but um, you know that's been a an interesting piece. It basically, is a mobile billboard as part right. of the DVI process. So, there's been a lot of conversation about that internally about like, could we like could we um, put a revenue play there? Not specifically at Velo, because we honestly, like, I believe that from a UI perspective, like, it's to get the customer to do business with you and, like, right. prove the estimate, right? Not to sell them yeah, potentially for sure. more or sell yourself revenue space. But from a billboard perspective, that's what jogged the, my memory on some of that discourse that was happening. So the ways that I see it is if, you know, in an extremely transactional shop could put um, something, like, in other words, you could control it. And if they could do their own ads, you know, say tire rotation, this much when selected with promotion banner, right? Stuff, things yeah. like mm-hmm. that, or or hear me out now. Hear me out because you're, this is giving me like here, this, anxiety here. This, this is, is how just so <laughs> let me just let me just tell you how Mike Allen's going to use it. Mike Allen is going to say he wants space on all of his competitors' DVIs, <laughs> right? <laughs> He's going to say we do free diag. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna discount until we're lower than them. I guarantee. You either have to pay for the premium package of this particular DVI, or we're gonna run competitor ads like Yelp does. <laughs> we're gonna run competitor ads right underneath your DVI. Have you ever um, just referencing my previous role? With, you know, before Vila, I was on the franchise automotive side of things with software. Yeah. Have Have you looked at a franchise dealership website recently? Like, I don't know if no. you've been shopping for a car, but one of the things that was like a true date. This would literally drive. I could probably bring up some examples at some point, but this would drive David crazy. We would always have like, we would, when I was at that company, we'd build websites with yeah. inventory and everything else. And then basically the whole thing was, how do you get the consumer to select that, you know, learn more or, you know, buy now, whatever else. Right. So yeah. one specific call to action from a marketing standpoint, you guys mm-hmm. do this all the time, right? 
you don't confuse the customer well. What ended up happening, especially um, when OEM started to come into the fray and certify certain products, you'd have all of these third-party widget bolt-on type call to action things, right? Yeah. You'd have your simple like contact us, but then you'd have here's your payment. Then you'd have get your Carfax report. Then you'd have you know chat with us. Next thing you know, every one of those squares that shows a piece of inventory had 25 buttons on it. <laughs> and and um, dealership customers would start saying, why is my conversion rate so bad right now? Like, why I'm getting yeah. so many customers, but nobody's clicking on any of these links. And you're like, you're giving them 25 different options. Like, Overload. And especially if you look at it on a mobile device, you know, because on a desktop, the buttons are all like in a four by four yeah. grid, right? A mobile device, they'll stack one to one. Right. Right. So all of a sudden, like to scroll through one listing of a vehicle, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, infinite yeah, scroll, yeah. like going yeah. through the entire thing. So that was one thing that's like really, and I'm in David's camp, which is like, I'm obsessive about UI components and like yeah, usability of sure. a product. And that thing, like that whole experience, like, and there wasn't anything that we could do about it because yeah. all of these like bolt-ons were actually certified by the OEM and they were, and there was a lot of regulation on that side of the business. So what I see over here where it's like, we actually have the power to say, eh, we built the UI for a very specific reason yeah. and we're not just going to, you know, bolt things on with a little bit of script or a little bit of HTML, like whatever else. So we try to keep it as clean as we possibly can. Could the UIs always be better? Absolutely. But just going back to the point about the consumer experience on sites, like yeah. Google has even started deprioritizing content that hot or that uh, ads that hide content, right? Right. In the recent um, yeah, I saw that. update. So like they call them interstitials, which is a fun word that I like to use and confuse people because that's just what they call them is, you know, you go to an article and if there is an ad that pops up that blocks the content behind it, Google will actually yeah. deprioritize that listing within the search engine results page. So it's kind of this interesting thing about like they're trying, Google, say what you will about them and some of the data stuff that they do, but um, their ability to say at least like, hey, if you're clicking on a link, we expect you to get what you're looking for, not an ad so served up Penalize the other. So, right. so I, I appreciate that component of it. Um, but that that just, again, is sort of triggering, and I have scar tissue from my previous role, which was just all about like everybody grabbing for everything, right? I can right. prove my tools the best if I get the most clicks on it. So I'll, not only did you have you know that four-by-four four button grid, but all of a sudden you had buttons that were flashing. You had right. buttons that were like, different shapes because they're because everybody was competing for the exact same amount of attention from the same customer that was visiting the website so that type of stuff just and it still goes on to today like if you go to a car dealer website especially for a certified provider like a toyota kia volkswagen you'll see it all the time there's like no rhyme or reason to what the call to action is it's very much just like competitive uh for competition for eyeballs is essentially what it is so when this was before uh, before you came into Shopware would have seen it when mm -hmm. they started developing DVX, right? Yeah. That's when a lot of those conversations were happening is what does this look like from the client perspective? And is this does this make sense? Is it confusing? Does it work? And And it was like Andrew and I had a number of conversations about just the perspective of the client on this. Mm -hmm. and And, you know, we spent probably an hour or two hours sending messages back and forth the other day going through like, hey, what does this look like? Does this make sense? Does this work like it's supposed to? You know, and so I think that was one of the cool things about Shopwares because they spent a lot of time and attention into the client experience mm -hmm. more, not necessarily more so than the shop experience because the shop experience, like we're the ones working in it every day. We're the ones trying to make it work the way it's supposed to and go through it and and have speed and efficiency with it. Whereas a lot of shop management softwares they end up forgetting about the end experience. They only focus on the shop experience. Mm -hmm. And so it was really cool to see Shopware focus wholly at one point in that process on the consumer. Love Andrew. Um, I just started, so similarly to Monique, where I just like worked my, I've been, I've yeah. known Monique for a while, but I worked my first trade show with her. I worked my first, you know, chronic kind of product feedback loop with Andrew recently yeah. from Shopware. And the two things that I really appreciate about Andrew, one is his discovery process, which is very much yeah. like whenever we get on a phone with a customer for the most part. Now, there are certain customers out there that we appreciate are more constructive, right. um, like yourself. There are other customers that we get on and they're, in, they're an owner operator. So in a lot of cases, their mindset is typically solution, solution, solution. So you know they know the problem internally, potentially, and they say, put this button here, create this configuration, this report, so they get automatically into, here are three solutions that we can address that. 
Andrew does a really good job of like, let's just reset a little bit and just consider that we're not going to even think about the product right now. Talk to me about what the actual problem is inside the shop. Is it a personnel problem? Is it a process yep. problem? And then he'll go into, okay, now that we know sort of this base layer, right? We're not just playing whack-a-mole with symptoms. We're actually thinking, you know, what's the main cause of the stress or the friction? Yeah. And then we'll start talking about solutions within the product that can p- potentially address that. So love that about Andrew. And then <clears throat> the other thing about him too, and this is actually something that I picked up from just going back to mentioning uh, Lisa Coyle, because she always used to say this is... Um, she wants people that wake up every day in terms of their job obsessing about X, right? Yeah. So yeah. one of our biggest things was, um, you know, maybe about a year and a half ago, we hi- we appointed somebody over shop management to oversee all of onboarding because right. we know that first 30 to 90 days is just like critical, right? That's a huge yeah. change for a system. So we said, we want this person, Paul is his name, Paul Forsey. We want him waking up every day thinking about how to make the customer experience better, how to make onboarding yeah, excellent, for sure. how to be obsessive about it and not be in the weeds all day, right? Because we have plenty of people that are working with customers on a daily basis doing data migrations, installs, training, et cetera. But we need somebody to think about the actual like experience from a high level. Andrew does that for shopware. He's the guy that wakes up every single day thinking about especially DVX because I did a, I was saying I did a presentation yesterday on on the DVX experience as part of Ratchet & Wrench. Uh, Andrew helped me prep a lot of it because right. I'm like, I need to pick this guy's brain because he yeah. was here from inception and just has a very passionate um, approach to yeah. DVX. So being able to kind of consult him on like, you know, how much of it, if you had to sort of select the pie chart of how much of it is dependent on the shop versus the consumer and then kind of where that also, I guess that Venn diagram meets with the intersection. Um, he was really prescriptive on how we developed DVX and then also yeah. how it is deployed and worked back and forth from the shop side. So end user number one, and then also, all right, let's look at it on an incognito browser. Let's, let's look yeah, at it on sure. an emulator. Let's yeah. look at like actually see what it's like from the consumer. user well, side. And, and so his thing was, is that he's still a consumer, right? Like mm-hmm. he still uses auto repair. So he says, how would I want this to look if I'm, if I'm the auto repair consumer, what should this look like? Yeah. What would I want? How would I want it to be? And that's kind of cool, right? Yeah. And then, like, one of the interesting things, so there were, when when Velo came in, there were a lot of concerns about, oh, my gosh, what are they going to change? And is it going to work? And is it going to be this? And is it going to be that? Now, some of those people, like, not to speak poorly, but some of those people had reason to feel that way, right? Yeah. Because... If you'd been there from the very beginning, there were times that promises were made or we're going to do this and and things don't always happen, right? Now, that's nobody's fault and that happens with every single one of these products, right? But in the same respect, it's been really cool to see like even some of the little tiny small, hey, there's an inconsistency there or this doesn't work like this. It seemed like all that started getting fixed and like rounded out when Velo came in. What do you think made the difference there? Really good question. Um, I I try to think about it internally and externally. So you made a really good point about like not only, you know, sort of the potential stress or pessimism of, you know, what things are like when Velo takes over because, you know, change is hard for anybody and especially when you have a company that has so much brand equity and product, you know, functionality like Shopware, a big acquisition like that can be really stressful and cause a lot of heartburn. So thinking internally first with the team itself, that was like number one, because we're in this super um, exciting yet disruptive time of shop management software, yeah, right? Yeah, like for if, sure. if you, you, gosh, even if you think about it to when I started in 2020, like Techmetric had just come on the scene, shopware was getting stronger, but really it was, you know, Mitchell and Aro were still the Titans out there. And, mm-hmm. you know, we were all David playing versus Goliath and, now it's kind of like we're at parity with a lot of those different products out there. Yeah. So it's like, what is the slight competitive edge that you can have, you know, over somebody that's selling a different solution or a different product for the market? So internally, the you know kind of hesitance around oh, big acquisition. What does this mean for us now for the personnel? Um, granted, I thought the leadership of Shopware did a great job yeah. setting the scene, Carolyn especially for sure in terms of like what does this mean for the team. Um, and then also internally, I think we have super strong at Velo cross-functional leadership. So we have people that represent different components of the business, customer success and onboarding, customer support, development, 
product management, sales, marketing, sales ops. So <clears throat> the ability, and I'll use a very, I hope this isn't too trite, but a very important Ted Lasso quote to, yeah. for me, which is uh, be curious, not judgmental. Right. Um, I was a part of a big acquisition back in 2015 when um, a company called Dealer Socket acquired a company I was at called Dealer Fire. And they run, they ran the private equity playbook, which is we know how to make you profitable, do these things. Right. Velo does it completely opposite, which is we bring in the founders and literally have this way into buy in type, you know, conversation about what do you do things that you think are great? Where do you think you need improvement? And really the investments that Velo make are around like how do we make the those weaknesses stronger or how do we amplify the strength? So that's a view internally, which is something that a lot of acquisitions like typically the owners like on a one-year transition plan or something like that and carolyn works with us you know one-to-one -one. she recently left the business but um she and i talk pretty regularly and it's actually funny now because she's still a shopware user oh yeah yeah <laughs> so for sure like for sure person that like built the product that's now like submitting customer feedback and like using it as a end end user for like the first like as a day-to-day -day operator right without first without having <clears throat> that that integral day-to-day -day operation within Shopware. Yeah, exactly. that's pretty cool. So the founder transition piece is very, very important because you have to have the trust. You have to have the validation of like Carolyn saying, this is the right move yeah. for us right now in this market because you guys have seen it. There are sides assembling, whether it's mergers yeah. that have recently taken place, acquisitions, consolidations, contractions. There's also a ton of PE coming into the space and investing in... Uh, uh, shops, right? Like yeah. enterprise and MSO type growth. Yeah. So to really solidify and strengthen that brand, we knew that an acquisition was the right way to go. And, and Carolyn agreed with us on that. And now it's all about how do we take that torch? How do we take that baton? I mentioned this in a conversation with Braxton not too long ago, which was funny, but, uh, and keep doing the things that made them yeah, important. successful in the first place. Yeah. And a lot of that's product. Honestly, like the investment in product, trying to strengthen the product, trying to continue that parity and then also build a competitive edge and then also um, making sure that the brand is out there, right? Yeah. Like typically when you see the acquisition, acquisitions, one of the first thing to go from a cost standpoint is marketing. Like we're not going to that show. We're not going to go to that show. We're not going to go to that show. So we want to make sure that the brand is out there. But at the same time, and you guys have probably seen at, at this conference, for the first time ever, we're actually exhibiting as like an ecosystem of shop management. Yeah, I thought not that just was like really the, cool. Thought that appreciate was really that. Mandy's cool. back there. She'll love that comment. Yeah, she, <laughs> I up. keep telling Double her to sit down up. and talk with us. But no, she just wants to mime. Um, <laughs> she just <laughs> okay. wants to direct I'm here from and stand afar. right in front of the camera <laughs> so we can get them. <laughs> She's like zoom in on, on Mandy. So and gosh, if you think about you know even two years ago, one of the things that was like part of our playbook was um, to go back to the Fight Club reference we don't talk about Velo. Like people come to shows and be like, what's this all Velo? Like we didn't have a website. We didn't have yeah. anything on the internet outside of maybe like a LinkedIn page for recruiting. So now we pull back the curtain. We're like, hey, here's all 16 brands that we represent. What we some do. dealerships, some payments, some you know aftermarket software. Here's what we do. And we find it to be, you know, stronger in market. Although we still got to work through the, you know, gaps of like, you know, somebody walks up to the booth and they say, you know, they see the, sh the four shot management products that we're representing here. And they're like, oh, are these all integrated? How do these work together? And you're like, yeah. well, actually, it's more about like what cu customer is the right yeah, what fit for what for product. You. Yeah. So we're still dialing that in. I mean, we got pl plenty of lessons to learn. And this is a great show to kind of work out some of those yeah. kinks. And we'll be at Seaman Apex representing kind of like shop management as well. Yeah. Uh, much bigger footprint that we're going to have there. And we'll have individual demo stations for each project or each product, too. But it's it's a much different approach than you know kind of the com the other competitors that we face off of in, in the market where it's kind of like trying to be one for everything one for all yeah. we're trying to find the right solution for the right type of shop right so yeah. we have protractor who's a true enterprise you know if we have 100 150 170 type location shops on that then we have you know shop boss which is like hey we're just getting into digital digital transformation we want to dip our toe into creating invoices and maybe yeah. doing some dvi getting payments okay fine shopware is really like the best coverage of the entire gap which is you know hey you have one or two locations but you want to be at five locations in the next year or two this, this is a will perfect do product what we need to do because yeah. we have mso capability we have a great digital vehicle experience we have really good and this is probably one of the nicest things especially about being a part of velo is that 
all of our shop management systems are directly integrated with 360 payments. Yeah. And well, like that's that one of the things I was going to ask about. Yeah. And, and so like, I've always wanted to get to the point and Carolyn did not like the idea at all. Um, and, and in fact, she told me that that would never happen, but she didn't like it. But, um, I always wanted to get to the point, like the financing was integrated into shopware. So I'm not having that discussion. Like when they're approving their estimate, if they need financing, they can apply while they're approving their estimate, right? And so I've started seeing little things that I've noticed that were from the other brands mm -hmm. within Velo that like there's better integration, there's better communication across the platforms, right? Because mm -hmm. I talk to a lot of the people within all of these platforms because I'm friends with them. And so you start hearing that where before there was no communication or there was trouble with APIs and there was stuff like that. Now that communication smoothed out and things just flow mm -hmm. much faster and much better than they had before. Yeah, one of the call outs from our, from our um, VP of engineering, Shashir, who's just a uh, wonderkin literally at, at aftermarket. Um, all of our integrations as part of the family should be better than any integration that we have externally, yeah. right? So yeah. nobody should ever come to us and say, hey, this 360 or this payments integration with, you know, company X yeah. is way better than anything that they have with Shopware or Shop Boss or Protractor, et cetera. Like if we hear that, it's like nails on a chalkboard. It's like, we, right. that can't happen. Like we have to be the best internally first because nobody should ever ask the question, especially now that we're exposing more of the Velo brand. Yeah. Nobody should ever ask the question of like, well, if you and 360 are in the same family, why is this integration suck so much? Or why, you know, yeah. why is it so clunky? Why is it slow? Why, you know, so we really try to work on that to the best of our ability. And now what we're getting to also, which is kind of exciting is going to more of like a common API platform. So yeah. you can imagine with, you know, we have nine products across aftermarket because we also have auto shop solutions. We also have auto serve yeah. one, right? So we're kind of building the whole customer ecosystem. Uh, but the biggest thing is, you know, instead of now doing nine integrations to a yeah. data provider or to a payments provider, we have one common API layer that sits over the top of all of those. That's kind of cool. And plugs into one spot so that we make one update from both sides. Um, so That's we're just trying neat. to scale that out a little yeah. bit more so that it's not sucking up development time as well. Because you can imagine like those ad hoc integrations are just a pain in the butt. Like they're important and customers want them, which we totally understand. But sometimes, you know, you're pulling developers off of big, you know, boulder type projects to like, hey, we got to fix this one API call. Yeah, the, out, you know, they, this one. It's they it want this difficult. type of product or they want this type of integration, mm -hmm. but they also want this big problem fixed. And yep. it's like, which is it? Like, what do you want? Yeah, there's a there's a compromising effort that typically takes place place and. We've also built a bit of a, we, we call it the COE or the center of excellence, even though it's remote, but um, we built out kind of like a, a separate group of engineers and developers that can yeah. work on multiple platforms because although, and I'm sure people can assume this, but although we have the six products in shop management yeah. um, and they all do shop management things, they are very different, not only very from much a customer so. perspective yeah. and from a UI perspective, but also from an architecture uh, perspective. Yeah. Some are on Azure, some are on AWS, some are on other platforms. So the ability to try to you know standardize to the best of our ability and then also get a collective of developers that are just you know masters of all yeah. or at least to the most part that they can be like an integration person can do multiple things with multiple platforms to have that team that can kind of scrum different projects around velo as opposed to just like right. here's the requirements here's the work okay go you know put your fingers on the keyboard and get to building so we try to be a little bit more thoughtful um, on how we do some of the development now, and that's really driven, again, by sort of that Velo cross-functional leadership. Right, the the standardization, for sure. The the tire guru thing, so I, I was talking to a shop the other day, and they said, hey, we do a lot of tires, and we also do mechanical repairs. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're using Shopware, but we also have another tire software on top of what we're doing. Is there ever a chance that Shopware will either get better tire integration or is there a chance that there's a way that these these dual function because I mean, I don't know that I like the idea. I mean, what do you think using using two softwares like that? My fear would be so they, they would use like the tire software for the quick lube side of the business and they would do tires. All they did was tires and they did uh, oil changes on the tire software. I don't know anything about tire <laughs> software. I don't know why you would need it's inventory is inventory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the so the reason that they wanted a different tire software is because it did the automatic federal reporting, like when the the automatic can't, tire can't registration it be done on the background in shopware. 
to a degree, but I mean, this is this is hey, give me your name, your address. You no, I'm asking him. He he knows how to do that stuff. You don't know. Well, I'm, no, I'm well, saying he's an operator. He, I mean, I don't work in a shop, so that's the experience speaking, right? Of like what you can and can't do. But I, I'll talk about the shop, the software side. Well, so side. The, to register a tire, right? Like you have a federal requirement to either give them a registration card. So that means you have to have a stack of registration cards, and you have to remember it, and then. The DOT number is on their invoice and shopware, so they could just write that down mm. if they wanted to do that. Or um, I guess the other option would be is you register it for them manually by collecting their address and everything else, which is an awesome way to improve your marketing. Just got to get the right address with the <laughs> apartment number. I do those follow-up <laughs> cards. Box. Yeah, I do follow-up cards yeah. with uh, auto shop have follow-up. To ask. House or apartment. That's just like standard. Yeah, well, I'm not on the front counter. Mm. <laughs> But but I guess my thing is is it is a legal requirement that you register the tire. Sure. So mm-hmm. and and does Tire Guru do automatic mm-hmm. registration? Yep, automatic registration, warranty. Like they're I mean, they're so embedded into the tire. I mean and the other part of it too, um, and this is kind of in the background, but um, the software with Tire Guru is actually um, private labeled for a number of large tire distributors, yep. um, and it's used to do ATD, and it's used to do. Oh, a that's couple cool! Others. I didn't yeah. know that. So the turn the air temperature down. Yeah. The um, so it, it's an interesting point about like, hey, is there ever in a scenario where you know there's this combination? Um, the best example. So this all goes, I think, to like this whole notion of digital and software convergence yeah and that just goes to say like from a market standpoint there's more of these services that are being absorbed into general services and repair best example i can give and that's simply because um, we went through this we actually purchased um velo um acquired a product back in 2019 called profit boost Do okay. you remember profit boost Is no that i that don't remember it so Profit Boost was a product that played primarily in the transmission repair market. Okay. okay? So they had very specific transmission um, repair, you know, guidelines. They had um, diags. They had a lot of relationships. Uh, there was a, a former, I don't know, I think they combined with somebody, but there was a, a association called Astra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that used to do a show as part of Apex and SEMA. Yeah. And it was and a transmission specific show. I think right? they're doing the same thing this year. Yeah. And they're doing their training and everything. Bingo. So, but what you started seeing, especially in like even 2019, 2020, is that a lot of general repair shops started to take in like, hey, we can just do transmission repair over here because there's right. more options baked in. So we ended up just, and Profit Boost didn't have that many customers attached to it. So we actually ended up doing a migration effort and sent most of those customers over to Shop Boss at the time because yeah. we didn't have Shopware at the time. And we built a lot of those transmission specific features. We built Profit Per Hour and a few other things directly into Shop boss okay. for those customers to migrate over. And we still have many of those customers today. So if you think about that scenario, tires, we typically say like the rule of thumb for us, and it's, it's especially if we're thinking about like, what's the ideal customer for, for Tire Guru? The rule of thumb for us is if you're doing 10% or more of your revenue in tires, yeah. Tire Guru is probably a good fit for you because it has all of those features baked into it. Um, what you'll likely see, you know, certainly there's not going to be a, a migration effort of Tire Guru and Shopware, but what we think is really f- interesting is that we're starting to carve out pieces of Tire Guru because we feel like it's a really strong beachhead in the market, especially for EV yeah. services. Right. We're starting to carve out pieces of Tire Guru and put them into Shopware. Oh, that's Shopware, cool. Shopware right now actually has a pretty strong tires component. The Protractor has a pretty strong tires component as well. They're integrated with Community Tire and a few others, so they have like a lot of inventory that in distributor supplier type um, you know functions they have access to. But actually, at Seam and Apex, and we'll, we can chat about this later. But Tire Guru is actually releasing um, their tire price optimizer. Right. Um, another little, you know, Wizard of Oz behind the curtain thing about Velo is we also acquired a company called Fitman Group based out of Duluth, Minnesota. Okay, they are the primary provider of tire and wheel upfit data or Dude, fitment data, I should say, for crazy. North America. So they power Fitman Group powers the data for a lot of these tire distributors, Tire Connect, Tire what, like few of the like yeah. a lot of these. So we can leverage that tire data for North America. Yeah. 
and we can actually do the tire price optimizer is, okay, what inventory of tires do you currently have in stock or have access to? Yeah. And then how does that compare to other tire pricing within the market? And it'll actually give you a margin up or down in terms of what you're selling your tires for against your competitor, against your market, against your region, against your state. So something nobody else out there has. It's right. going to launch primarily in Tire Guru first because that's our bread and butter yeah, right? is, yeah. is the tire market. Uh, but we've we've tested it with a few other shop management systems, and we really think that that's like the next piece that's going to be important, especially as you see more convergence of, hey, if I can, you know, maybe it, I went from I don't know five EVs a month to twenty five or to fifty, yeah. right? And the tires on those burn out so fast. I yes, they do. They I go crazy. They it's twenty percent faster than than a you know combustion engine tire. Um, so the ability to have access to tires through the inventory, which that's like what we own. And then also the ability to say, am I pricing these tires correctly? Like, I think yeah. that's one of the biggest pain points that a lot of shops do right now is right. like pricing too high. Am I pricing too low? Like it's, it's kind of a game of like darts, like just throwing them at a dartboard. So the ability to have that knowledge powered by data in this case, especially since that's yeah. part of our family, again, a very important and big integration for us uh, is really going to, I think, help drive that forward within the shop management sector. Who knows, you know, in the next two to three years, like how, you know, does that go from, yeah, you're doing 10% of your revenue in tires, 20% of your revenue in tires. Um, I had a conversation with a, a gentleman, uh, his name's Tim Ferguson, who does, um, is a part of the Tire Pros ATD program. Um, and he quadrupled his tire business. Uh, really? Just in the last two years, one from implementing Tire Guru and more of those options. Um, and then two, and this is kind of a, a still growing piece, is he actually bought a mobile tire installation van. Oh, that's cool. And they literally stock the tires the night before, take reservations from the website, and it's literally a mobile service van, van that drives around to customers. I've got a friend of business or kind whatever of similar else. to that. Yeah. Um, and he, he attributes that not only to the service that they're booking through, the tire service they're booking through that, but also uh, the advertising, right? So if yeah. you're driving around town all day and it's got, you know, Tire Pros, whatever else on it, um, the ability to have that as basically a moving billboard. So that's been kind of an interesting that's thing on the tire side that's popped up recently is like, and it's huge over in the UK, huge, right. like the ability for them to drive to your place of work, to your home or wherever else to change your tires out, you know, whatever else. Um, and that is really like peaking in the market right now. It's yeah. that's pretty cool. Um, I've got one last question for you. Um, the CDK thing, right? You saw all that. Mm. Oh yeah. Does stuff like that keep you up at night? <laughs> Always. I mean, we have a pr that. So here's another, you know, kind of nice thing about Velo is, man, since we're private equity backed and we have, you know, the people that have been there done that, we have a very progressive and serious security team. Yeah. So we're always doing, you know, not only. Um, you know, security penetration type testing. We have a third party um, company that does um, security and data testing for us um, every year. Uh, but we also actually, and you guys probably can understand this because I think this is one of the CDK like gaps that they had was we do personnel and employee specific security training. Yeah. Right? Cause like the social, what do they call it? Uh, social engineering right. is the, is really the biggest gap. I, w I was at a company a long time ago and uh, one day I got this email that said, hey, you've been enrolled in two years of uh, credit monitoring. I'm like, what is going on? Like, this has to be spam, right? Right. And, you know, maybe an hour later, the CEO sent out a note that said, we uh, had an issue where somebody reached out to a, you know, leader in the company posing as yeah. CEO and asked for all the employees' W-2s. Zip file. <laughs> oh, out the my door. God. <laughs> so they... It, to their credit, like, and this is a while ago, right? So this, we were still working on our security, and this is a startup company. Uh, but they, to their credit, they bought us all credit monitoring for a couple of years to make sure that we weren't compromised. Right. But the social engineering part is true because I get ten texts a day right now saying, "Hey, Kevin, this is David from Velo Holdings. Will you approve a two point one million dollar yeah cash infusion?" Blah blah. blah. And I'm like, "This is th these are texts." Dude, yeah, well, the scams are getting crazy, like oh, on man. Facebook, yeah. LinkedIn. I mean, everywhere. I mean, you just get all these crazy. It, it, I mean, it's always been bad, but like the telephone calls have ramped up, the messages on Facebook have ramped up, the messages in groups, and like it just. Yeah, it makes you think about the the web based life that we live now. 
I just the last night I got a text saying that your chase cars a chase card has been hit for five hundred nineteen dollars at the Apple store. Yeah. And I like click here to approve or decline. Mm-hmm. And I'm like <laughs> It's you got to treat every no matter who yeah. the emails from now yeah. you got to treat it with you yeah. know the utmost cynicism and say you know are there misspellings in here or do I just have a friend that can't spell just don't click anything off an email that's I it mean, like a hundred percent across the uh, board hey, and it's do a generational thing right too email. I feel like our generation is probably more apt to like be very like head on a swivel with that type of stuff. Um, my mom actually got taken. My mom's in her 60s. She actually got taken for about $500 a couple months ago because she was buying. Uh, I don't know if you guys, you guys have kids, so I don't, but I don't know how old they are, but our kids are super into Bluey, right? The yeah. Cartoon. Oh, yeah. Bluey Dude, I'm an adult and I'm into like Bluey. Bluey. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's like my kid left the couch 20 minutes ago. I'm like, but wait, what happens to bingo? In this episode? <laughs> All right. Uh, but she got taken for a pretty big sum of money, 500 bucks, because she wanted to buy our boys tickets to there was like this Bluey like show that was going on in Madison or something like that. And she got a, I don't know what happened in the process, but she got sent a link that was like, hey, Bluey tickets for a discount. Blah, blah. It was probably because mm-hmm. they knew it was in Madison, so they just like targeted anybody's info they had. She clicked on it because she's like, of course I want to buy Bluey tickets at a discount for my grandkids, right. right? And she ended up giving her debit card, so she couldn't do chargeback or anything oh, like that. No. So she got she got money taken from her, and she even called the place that did the show, and she's like, hey, look, like I haven't received the tickets yet. Like, they're like, oh, yeah, that's a scam that's been going around. And I'm like, oh, no. Like, my right. poor mom, who just is, like, trusting of everyone, right? Just the nicest woman of all time, and it's like, you just, you get taken for it. Like, it, you get taken advantage of, because people are there to do it. At some point, though, I mean, like, as bad as it's gotten, right? I mean, does it, because, I mean, in some ways, Facebook has become pretty terrible for it right like you have to pay a lot of attention and, and if you weren't paying attention or you, were, you talking, who's clicking anything off of facebook well no i understand i'm just saying that the the number of messages and the number of things you get in facebook is non-stop like it, if you go to your spam folder you just see hundreds and hundreds look, check it right don't know, don't it care. text messages spam yeah. text messages <laughs> if you run so mandy will mandy will appreciate this one but if you run any business accounts on facebook right if yeah. you're doing ads or anything else mm-hmm constant messages from yeah. bots and spammers yeah. that say your business account is going to be shut down non-stop. in 12 days because of non-payment please click this like it is crazy yeah. Yeah. you hundreds have to turn off hundreds of them. point and mm-hmm. sorry to any you know shop boss shopware protractor and or customers that are reaching out via facebook messenger and like you know trying to yeah, ask dude. these questions because we're like we're, we're getting 20 a day but luckily, you know, I think a lot of people understand now that there's been enough emphasis put on it, but there's still that, like, what's the next phase of this? I actually heard the other day, um, I don't know what company it was, but this was an interesting use case was that, um, there was a, um, scammer that took a YouTube video of a CEO, ran it through an AI software that extracted the voice and then used that voice to call an employee and say, Hey, I need this information for right. blah, blah, blah. And it was a voicemail. So like you have the CEO whose voice was essentially taken out and used against him just because it was out there. Like what's the next phase of like social engineering that includes AI. Yeah. It's a whole nother thing. So we, we do it. I mean, nobody's bulletproof out there. Nobody CDK like that. They had that. I think, you know, there's another big provider. I won't mention names, but last year that had the huge, yeah, outage for you know two three days cdk was two weeks and they had a huge rant granted i did like the one thing that i will appreciate about the cdk situation is they were pretty upfront and transparent about like yeah. like guys we've been hacked it was our fault they want us to pay this ransom like they didn't need to say all that and typically cdk has been a little bit more like withholding in terms of yeah. information like even previously but i will give them some credit on their communication but either way it's like that's a i mean you think about all the not only automotive systems that were down with that, but any accounting services, yeah, ADP, like there was a lot of disruption well, from that. So the the assistant manager or the manager that I just hired for the shop is an assistant manager at a dealership. Mm-hmm. And he was saying that um, when, the, when CDK sent out messages that gave an update saying, hey, we hope to be back online. It's probably going to be this much time. It's going to be about a week, blah, 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 blah. There are some of you that we're going to contact and we're going to have you on earlier, right? Mm-hmm. And then right after that, they started getting telephone calls. And so they would answer the telephone and the, the one manager wasn't there. And so a staff member who's trying to be proactive and like get this fixed 
says, okay, well, let me let me walk through this with you. I'll get you what you need. Well, they didn't ask for the manager, right? Mm-hmm. So, well, A, wouldn't they be asking for a manager or someone who manages the software? And that particular person, from my understanding, was listening to them and starting to go in and click here and click there and do this and do that. And then it's like, wait a minute, why do you need a client social security number, right? Like that doesn't make sense. And so they went back and they called and they found out that the email that they had received saying it would be this long and we'll be calling you was one of those scam emails that Mm -hmm. that somebody was either taking advantage of that or it was the original person who got into CDK that was looking for specific dealerships to obtain information from, right? And it could have been one of those Calcutta, would you please quit kicking that camera? You're going to drive me nuts. That's just me vibrating from the caffeine. <laughs> it's not <Sorry>. actually David. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, but so like they they had targeted specific dealerships yeah. to go in and start trying to get client information from. I bet you money it's one of those like whole Calcutta buildings that where they just employ scammers on every floor of the building. Hey, it's and you know the everybody the, got hacked. Everybody's social lot security of, number is out. Yeah, they, I, like whatever seven hundred million whatever social security numbers or whatever got got released. Our, uh, yeah, our uh, everybody our, got hacked. Our CIO, Chief Information Officer, has done this for many many years. Very like ton, Fortune five hundred companies. Like he's been around the block. And um, one of the things he says, which is actually was very interesting for me, was. You know, certainly there's click farms, there's, you know, scammers out there that make money off this, et cetera. There's bad agencies like, but actually like all the really, really bad circumstances that I've seen with hacks is somebody that's actually being kind of either held hostage yeah, and or um, someone that's like, you know, if it's blackmail or whatever else, it's typically like they'll find a really good developer from a company and you know in some cases it's sometimes brutal stuff and in some cases it's money stuff sometimes it's status stuff but he says a lot of the bad bad hacking scenarios that he's seen in the past is typically that somebody that's actually doing it against their will yeah which is even like if you think about it from you know uh uh, urgency standpoint, right? Yeah. Like click farms, they're just like in there all day, like, you know, trying to disrupt as much as they can. But the really bad actors are the ones that have to cause the most amount of damage. And it's like up to them to like, yeah, they got to work through their situation. So it's really, and it's in like so, yeah, in some cases it's internal is what I've seen. Yeah. That it, that it was somebody within the organization. So that's up. David, are you being blackmailed? Is that why you I act the way you do? <laughs> Blackmail me with. <laughs> we want you your money, know. David. I have none. Those bad I don't actors. have any money. I don't know what they're going to take. <laughs> it's all in crypto. It's all, it's all crypto. under the mattress. I've got some crypto. Do you? I haven't sure. sold any of it because then the government wants to come in and tax me. So I'm going <laughs> to right. wait. Yeah. I'm going to wait for a crypto friendly administration coming and go. Yeah, don't worry about the crypto taxes. Then I'll uh, sell it off. Locked up passcode. It's, yeah, it's it's in there forever. But Not, they even tell yeah. you like if you're if you're legit gonna carry crypto, you got you gotta have the little USB with the wallet key on there. You got like, yeah. If you put yeah. it on a broker site, <clears throat> My, it's hey man, I, subject um, to whatever. Kind of a personal story, but I, I had a cousin who was 40, 40 years old and passed away very unexpectedly. Did not have. Um, and he uh, didn't have, you know, a wife, kids or anything like that. He was single, uh, but certainly had family members. Yeah. And and he had been working, you know, since he was 20, basically as an IT um, admin at, uh, in Wisconsin. And he was making really good money. So, but he invested all of it in crypto. Yeah. And when he passed unexpectedly, unexpectedly his family couldn't get access to any of the accounts. He oh didn't have anything written down. He didn't have a will. He didn't have anything. So it took them... I think they we finally resolved it, but it took them two, three years to work through the legal process of like, where is this? What is this? Like, if you can yeah. just imagine that. So David's exactly right. Like, you better have some sort of at least bulletproof b- backup plan. Yeah. On, if you're um, gonna put money, in if it. you're gonna put money in it, because yeah, if something just all of a sudden happens, it's not like traditional financial institutions, right? Where yeah, it's I'm talking like you keep up. it on a USB drive <laughs> and you put it in a safe in a safety deposit box and that's where it goes because you put it on on with like Coinbase or look, look yeah, what happened with FTX the platform. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, just gone. The, like just money's gone. gone. Yep. And what do you do? Dude, yeah, 
You know? It's not backed by anything. Like, yeah. it's just, it's just code. Like, it's gone. Sorry. Yeah. Not that it's You're important, out. but what was your, what's your mother's maiden name? <laughs> what, was the, what was the name of the, what, what was your favorite? Um, what was your dog's name? Yeah. What was your dog's name? Your first dog's name? Yeah. Very fluffy. Good. <laughs> By the way. Okay, very uh, I weird spelling Snoopy. though. So you guys guess it. Ph. Me, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Ph. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Always good to to catch up. I know you'll be at um, Apex and SEMA. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll be there. We'll be at ASTA. ASTA. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll be there. Be. We'll that's be. it. That's it. <laughs> ASTA and then Apex, Apex and then we've got Institute in January, oh, February. Yeah. yeah, we'll be there too. Nice. And awesome. then you guys are going everywhere. Holy hey, crap. Well, Monique is, but you know. Well, as long as Mo's going, like everything's okay. <laughs> this we only care about Shopware. We only care about the rest of it. And 360 payments, we care about them too. Okay. What's whoa, the rest of it? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't care about 360 payments. <laughs> say three more say three more Vila products, you get fifty bucks. No. You know, the, the problem the problem they didn't have split funding. That was the pre- I tried them. I went to them. Oh. I'm like, hey, you guys have split funding? We don't know what that is. Oh. Okay. All right. So I, I had to go with somebody else. I, Lisa rolled her eyes at me the other day. Why? I think the last time I saw her, I was like, "Hey, remember that thing that um that I uh, signed up for the like financing portal through 360 payments?" Mm-hmm. She said, "Yeah." I said, "Um, I don't know what it is, and I keep getting billed for it, but I've never done anything." <laughs> with it. And she just rolled her eyes and walked away. She's like, "It sounds like 360's problem." I know, right? <laughs> no, this was before like, she. Do this you want to talk about the transition recruiting because? <laughs> Boy, do I know someone. Yes, absolutely. I, th- cool. They're doing really well. They really are. They got a rock. They got, you know, if you think about bringing in the, um, what is it? The, the space, the Monstars, right? Yeah. The Space Jam, like all the heavy hitters from the industry into like one um, company. That's what they've done over there. Yeah. Like they're doing awesome. Agreed. I love working with their team. We just launched a partnership with them and Protractor and then Shopware as well, where we're going to be doing some passing of info back and forth. That's give them cool. access to some of our data to measure technician efficiency. And, you know, we haven't really figured out exactly where we're going with it yet, but we do understand it's something that can help them fuel like more conversations with getting yeah. good, solid people into places. I just need to point out garbage in, garbage out. David doesn't clock uh, his employees in and out, so don't look at his data. <laughs> yeah, I don't do that. They don't clock in and out of jobs either, so. Meh. You suck. <laughs>